Hello, I'm Fabrizio Nevola, and I'm doing this recording of my talk, Public Renaissance, uh, that I did at the British School in Rome on Monday, the 15th of March. Unfortunately, the um, recording on the event didn't work out, and so I've, uh, um, I've, I'm making this recording again um, for those of you in the audience that were unable to hear most of what I was talking about when you joined online. So first of all, thank you very much to the BSR for the invitation um, and um, on the day um, uh, for, the, for the kind introduction. I'm a member of the Society of Renaissance Studies, um, the UK's Society for Academics and Non interested in um, all matters to do with the Renaissance. Um, and for those of you that don't know so much about the Society for Renaissance Studies, um, uh, you can join uh, for a fairly moderate rate, as you can as you can see, with a reduction for students. And the SRS um, publishes a well-known journal, uh, the uh, uh, a journal called Renaissance Studies, um, which it's been publishing for quite some some time now. Uh, and, the, uh, and the society also funds a number of fellowships, including the postdoctoral fellowships, for which um, there is a deadline coming up in late April, as well as more recently, the introduction of a new doctoral research scholarship um, as a collaboration um, with the British School in Rome. Um, that will have a closing date uh, in uh, the end of July this year. And the first recipient of that award um, will be coming later this uh, calendar year, Anna Howie from the University of Cambridge, um, who has a fascinating project on women's dress in Genoese portraiture. The SRS also runs a biannual conference, which um, has uh, obviously been affected by the recent um, pandemic, but um, for which the dates are now available um, July 2023 and a call for paper coming out soon, as well as uh, a monograph series, um, the studies in Renaissance and early modern worlds of knowledge. So look out for the SRS and I hope um, uh, if you're not a member, you might consider joining. So I'm an architectural and urban historian in the visual and cultural sense. And my first monograph was about one city, Siena, um, and the publication of that monograph coincided um, with a National Gallery exhibition, which I also contributed to. The conjunction of the monograph and exhibition underlined how important public dissemination is for research, and it's something that I've always been very keen on. In recent work, I've turned to a wider look at what I describe as street life in the early modern city, as well as what I've been describing as the material culture of public space. Developing out of this work are a series of apps that address the material and visual culture of historic urban environments. This participates in what's described, uh, what's known as the digital humanities or digital art history approaches to the Renaissance. I'll talk about my recent work today, but before doing so, I want to provide a little background the talk is made up of three unequal parts. First, I'll provide some research background to the Renaissance public space, as I mentioned. Then I'll discuss how I've been thinking about how the powerful computer everyone has in their pocket might be used more creatively by historians. I'll discuss first a series of apps that offer location-based interpretation. Then another project where apps are used to deliver 3D models of destroyed or transformed buildings as a one-to-one -one experience in cities and museums. The majority of the talk then is about making the Renaissance public rather than Renaissance public space, though there are of course overlaps. I'd like to say at the outset that all the work I'm discussing today would have been impossible without funding from UK and European research councils, as well as the Getty Foundation. And all the apps I'm discussing are free to download and use and operate with no profits. So a key interest of my work is the relationship of buildings and people that makes sense of cities as, as environments and communities. A good place to start for these sorts of concepts is the famous painting by Ambrogio Lorenzetti, sometimes known as the City of Peace, 
or good government in the city. It's a very well known manifestation of secular civic values and viewed in its original context, it, um, it represents uh, aspects of the urban, of a polity, of good government, of civic participation, in short, we could say of civil society. This is a representation of complex relationships that, co that construct civic image, a form of collective self-fashioning. Key to understanding this is the relationship of people and place. The interaction of people and space makes cities, and as we'll see in the discussion that follows, the triadic relationship between people, objects and spaces is the main focus of my research and my digital work. And in this um, page from uh, my recent monograph on street life, um, I'm uh, making the quite basic point that um, to understand Lorenzetti and to understand any city, we need not only to look at architecture and built form, but also social practices and what people do. And uh, in fact, we need to do this together. My research focus is on the experience of the urban realm, of public space, the meaning of what the contemporary urban designer, Jan Gale, calls life between buildings. And Gale will be known to some of you as the, um, essentially the inventor and promoter of shared space, uh, that, um, uh, that use of urban space, which for British audiences will be most familiar from uh, the Kensington Museum Exhibition Road uh, area, um, and, and all Brighton's new road, places where the um, hierarchies between uh, uh, cars, bicycles and people has been, has been reduced uh, to try and engage in a much more open, um, shared urban space. And in Gale's formulation, um, the, the people and social practices that they enacted is really where the focus lies. So his interest is first on life, then on the spaces which contain life, and then only then to think about buildings. And therefore um, reversing the hierarchies that very often are implied by architects and the idea that architecture can program, can control people's behaviours. And indeed, if we think about architectural history, uh, reversing the hierarchy of the uh, concentration on built form alone and thinking more about how built form is uh, engaged with by people. In street life, um, I apply the approach of Henri Lefebvre um, of the social production of space which has been so, so important in the spatial turn in the humanities, but also for attention to be given to the multiplicity of meanings created in public space by both government or institutional decisions and the everyday action of residents. The key word with the Fevre is the concept of inscribed meaning on space. Looking at this little known fresco in uh, Perugia, almost I would say a 16th century version of Lorenzetti, we can see more of the everyday actions. Students are going to class, women are bringing vegetables to market, merchants with their pack horses and generally groups of people milling about sociably in this paved intersection on the southern side of the city. Street corners have emerged throughout my work as important and are largely overlooked sites in the city places where the material fabric revealed traces of meaning, from street signs and coats of arms to bakeries and taverns where people gathered. And here in this um, uh, painting now in the Rijksmuseum um, of a subject which is largely still unidentified, uh, we can see that sort of um, milling around, somewhat productive, as you can see, some people are carrying uh, goods and there are people moving in and out of houses. Um, but nonetheless, this kind of social aggregation around public space. I found it quite useful to look at analogies between the past and the present, and to think about how space is constituted through the interaction of people. Here in a picture that I've just become quite attached to, around the amenity of a water fountain, 
fact, it's almost certainly not a Renaissance water fountain. It's probably from the 18th century uh, and it's in Lucca. But what I like about it is the way that people who don't otherwise know each other are gathering around that water fountain and sociability is occurring on account of that amenity. The everyday and more formal ways in which meaning adheres to place can be documented in many ways, from street shrines to speaking sculptures, from fountains and coats of arms to the sites where banditori, town criers, made their announcement, announcements. So in this collection of slides uh, of images on the top left, you see a fountain with coats of arms on the corner, the, um, uh, the uh, sprone uh, in Oltrarno near Ponte Santa Trinita, the speaking sculpture of Pasquino near Piazza Navona, also on a corner, or indeed the inscriptions that litter many of the, or litter, uh, occupy many of the corners of um, palaces and houses in uh, Renaissance Mantova. The um, regularity with which these markers are uh, traced onto the edges of these facades is marked on the map on the bottom right, whereas on the bottom left you're seeing a map in which I've plotted the locations of town criers uh, in the city of Florence in the late 15th century. So as you can see from these uh, latter examples in particular, um, mapping has been used to communicate patterns of repeated actions, if you like, the rituals of the everyday, as opposed to the grand ceremonial usage of the city. Mapping is a valuable tool of interpretation and, is and as many of you will know, especially archaeologists who were first to adopt this approach, digital mapping using latitude and longitude uh, coordinates through GIS, geo-information systems has been widely adopted in the digital humanities. And uh, the example I was showing there is of um, the census data of the 50, early 1560s in Florence, which was plotted onto a map by uh, a GIS map by the University of Toronto Decima team, led by Professor Nicholas Terpstra. While I've used geospatial data in my own work, the unifying theme running through the rest of today's talk is not GIS, but GPS global positioning services through location-based interpretation enabled, enabled by GPS that are one of the key affordances of the smartphone. Here in this uh, slide, what I'm using in a slightly dated version of the Google Maps interface, you can see the bringing together of the aerial view from a map and the street view in the street view interface. And to me, this kind of captures uh, quite effectively what Michel de Certeau talks about in the practices of everyday life, looking from the top of the um, uh, skyscraper in New York and seeing and observing the contrast between this eye in the sky of surveillance and the lived experience on the ground. Now, of course, digital technologies and the fast and ubiquitous adoption of mapping technologies delivered through GPS enabled devices have renewed and invigorated the spatial turn in the humanities that have been identified now for uh, a couple of decades. But what I'm really wanting to um, suggest with the pairing of the, on this slide between the Google images and the uh, uh, painting by Francesco Di Giorgio, uh, one of the Bicerne covers from Siena of the 1460s, um, is that this idea that there are two, at least two views of the environment, one which is from above, that of a deity in this instance, and that which is lived experience, perspectively rendered from below, as you can see in this painting, with the um, uh, assembly of temporary housing, which has been set up um, uh, quickly outside the city of Siena, al tempo dei terremoti, at the time of the earthquakes. So, moving to the main focus of the talk, the chances are that you found out about this talk on a screen, probably a mobile screen, on the phone you carry with you everywhere. On that same screen, you perhaps read the news as you commuted to work or went to the BSR for the talk. You found out about the weather, got help to locate a new shop, played games or watched your favorite show. In spite of the pervasive adoption of smartphones, historians have been remarkably slow in thinking about how handheld consumer devices might reshape the ways that we do history, both as a research process and as a means of communicating that research to a range of audiences, including our peers. 
This seems like a missed opportunity as the affordances of smartphones, their portable and pervasive nature, the fact that they are location sensitive thanks to GPS, their versatile screens able to show video, images, text, maps, 3D models and so on, and the microphone speaker pairing that provides their original function, make them a powerful tool for the delivery of complex interactive content. In what follows, what I'm really keen to do is to think about how we can also make sure, particularly a uh, concern for an art historian, that people look up like the silhouette in our um, marketing postcard on the left, rather than looking down as the uh, students walking along a street with their phones in their hands are doing. Moreover, the most common means of packaging content for phones, the app, the application, provides a system for the delivery of quality controlled material, a form of publication not so very different to a book. As a multimedia technology, apps delivered on smartphones and tablets provide new ways of presenting research to audiences, specialist and non. The Hidden Cities apps discussed now uh, shortly participate through practice in a series of recent turns in historical methods, digital, spatial, and concerned with mobility, to the extent that it could even be suggested, I would say, that apps can instantiate the, these research methods and approaches more effectively than communication on the printed page. So what are hidden cities and how do they work? You're now going to hear from Elizabeth Glanfield, a young widow that works, at, works in the monastic brew house of St. Nicholas's Priory, right in the heart of Exeter. One of our guides in the Hidden Exeter app. Hello, traveller. Passing through Exeter? Well, you've picked some day for it. The whole city's coiled like a spring. You can feel it in the streets. Perhaps you already know why. King Henry's men were here today just like they've been up and down England, swooping in, ransacking churches and convents. Everything belongs to the crown now, they say. And they've been taking down crucifixes and pictures of the saints. The saints, our protectors in heaven, idols they call them. And uh, of course that audio continues, but that's the introduction to one of our walks. It's 1536. And as we find out, Henry VIII's men have been in town as part of the drawn out process of suppressing the religious houses. Elizabeth has led a citizen resistance to the suppression of the priory and has been arrested and interrogated in the city's guild hall, where we meet her just after she's been released. Thus begins Dissolution and Descent, one of three itineraries in the Hidden Exeter app, in which Elizabeth and her brother William narrate two sides of the complex debate in favour and against the, tum the tumultuous changes to the demotional life of the city and indeed the country. And in so doing, touch on a range of subjects, from the archaeological evidence of the first turkeys found and eaten in England, to the local wool, wool trade, from fly-posted leaflets of religious descent, to the remarkable story of the successful, though short-lived, defence of the priory by a devout community gravitating around it. Hidden Exeter, like the other five city apps, Deventer, Florence, Hamburg, Trento and Valencia, adopts a light form of augmented reality or AR to engage the user in a location-based interpretation. On the one hand, a historical character is the narrator guide. On the other, the user is invited to explore the city using a georectified historical map, which extends the fiction of AR enabled time travel. AR enhances or augments the real world experience so that we walk in today's streets in the company of a local guide from the past, seeking out the visual traces of the early modern city that are hidden in plain sight, using a navigational aid in the form of a 400 years old map for Exeter, John Hooker's 1587 map of the city. At each site, not only do we hear Elizabeth's perspective, but additional discover more audio is provided by a modern location, often examining a specific object or document related to the site and events in question. Outside the city's guild hall, where we meet as Elizabeth, it is a document now held in the National Archives that describes the events and outlines the remarkable detail of men 
quote, appareled in women's apparel, that is dressed in women's clothing, that appears to have most shocked the king's men in the citizens' defense of the Exeter Priory. Additional written material, read more, is provided by further, is, uh, to further understand the historical evidence in a series of short articles hosted on the project website with recommendations for further reading. In this instance, directing the user to publish research by James Clark, who has recently explored the significance of this remarkable incident. As such, each site contains what we might describe as a series of nested content that moves from the scripted research and place-based storytelling to the short form interpretation and ultimately to traditional long form academic written analysis. However, location-based interpretation or situated research takes a form quite different to that of books or articles as the research trajectory is driven by the movement by movement so the sequence of an argument of, is set out along an itinerary and built up over a set of stops along it. The brevity required for audio delivered on site imposes certain limits on the interpretation to ensure that a chosen theme is developed over a series of sites without too many deviations from the main argument, while at the same time keeping the user engaged with the surroundings. So then, to stay with the dissolution and descent trail, the narrative arc begins at the Guildhall, the site where the trial account was set down, and moves back through the city to the Priory, where its events transpired. Through the careful selection of sites, some secular, others devotional, a narrative is built up that seeks to present the modern day user with a nuanced picture of the Tudor city and the debates that were taking place between maintenance, the status quo, and those that supported change. For instance, as Elizabeth passes the ancient church of St. Olaves, she comments on its construction from the local red heavy tree stone and the tradition of its foundation by King Harold's mother, that is King Harold um, uh, of the Norman, uh, again, from Norman conquest, but then goes on to discuss the recent visit of the preacher Hugh Latimer, enjoyed by her brother and late husband, but rather less so by her and others in the congregation who had threatened to haul him from the pulpit. You see the warm red stone of that tower passing? William comes here a lot. He's friendly with the rector of the parish. I fear for what will happen to churches like this. King Henry says he only wants to empty some of the monasteries and convents, but I worry they won't want to stop until every church is stripped bare. That's what Hugh Latimer was preaching in Exeter not two years ago, a real radical. William went to hear him, my husband too. They stood in Greyfriars churchyard in the pouring rain for hours. There was no use praying to the Virgin Mary, he said. Get rid of her and the other graven images. And uh, of course the recording goes on. Her observations point to the rapidly shifting religious political landscape reflected in the fact that when Latimer visited the city in 1534, he preached to a large crowd, but a mixed reception. But just over a year later, when our tour is set, he's become Bishop of Wor Worcester, thanks to support from Queen, Queen Anne Boleyn. Elizabeth therefore understands that change is afoot, but is resistant to it. He's By contrast, a few stops on, her brother William, a proud member of the Guild of Tuckers, Weavers and Shearmen, stops at the field of St. Bartholomew's that you see on the left-hand side of the map, just inside the city walls, where the wool cloth is stretched, and you can see the stretching racks, and comments on trade connections to the continent. loaded onto ships down at Exeter Quay, off to Flanders and Holland, but also to Normandy, Brittany, even Spain and Portugal. When these ships come back to Exeter, they're laden with barrels of wine and salt, among other things. Goods aren't the only things that come through our ports. I've seen pamphlets of all sorts against Rome from the Lutherans, and I know more than a few Exeter merchants who like what they've read or heard, 
who are ready to see the church reformed and think that King Henry should move faster now he's taken the first steps. Again, William's audio also continues. Here instead, we're given an insight to the excitement and possibilities of change that touched populations far from the centers of the theological and political debates of the time. The rival siblings position resolve in an argument that ends, uh, ends the trail at St. Nicholas's Priory, destined for closure in spite of Elizabeth's efforts, and a debate around the possible opportunities to be had from the asset stripping and fire sales of movable goods and properties that were to follow. And here I'll just give a last uh, sample. It will all be gone soon enough anyway. Thomas Cromwell despises relics, pilgrimages, our holy saints, all of it. King Henry's men will be back here too. They'll tear down the church and sell off what's left. This part would make a fine townhouse for a merchant, don't you think? A pleasant parlour where they can drink and eat turkey. <laughs> With the prior as their guest, no doubt. Nobody knows better than you that the brothers are as devoted to their ale. As they are to their prayers. Yes, I don't deny it, but... You know, it crossed my mind. I might be able to buy the watermill at Millhay for my own. Oh, wake up, William. The king has claimed everything. And who do you think will end up with the land when all's said and done? The local lords. Of course, the bigger picture of the effects of the dissolution is well known, albeit the interpretations differ on its destructive impact and iconoclastic fervour. But what the app trail offers is a view from the ground, narrated not by the big players of history books and enduringly popular historical fiction, but rather as seen by the everyday residents of a medium-sized regional centre like Exeter. In producing these character guides for the apps, most of them based on individual, individuals that can be traced to varying degrees in the historical record, a form of critical storytelling is applied, through which historical analysis is channeled through the themed narratives that characters present so as to give an audible voice to what may otherwise seem abstract concepts. As a research method, these character guides owe much to the practice of microhistory, to the degree that they favor overlooked testimonies from below, but suggest the potential to extrapolate wider meanings. Also to Sadia Hartman's practice of critical fabulations, where some degree of fictional interpolation fills the gaps of the historical record. Ultimately, however, the objectives of those are those of public history in the bid to take the historical research and make it accessible to audiences outside the academy. The short form narrative delivered through audio guides can convey complex themes in current scholarship while also diversifying their voices and perspectives commonly associated with cities and sites known for mostly elite commissioned cultural heritage. So then, for instance, in a series of itineraries through the 15th and 16th century Florence, users are introduced to five different characters. One of them, Marietta, was raised in the city's best known orphanage, the Ospedale degli Innocenti, and guides the visitor along a route connecting sites of women's work in Florence's vast wool trade with the many institutional sites of charitable Hi there. assistance. I'm Marietta, and welcome to Florence. I'll bet you've seen the big sites already our great cathedral, the baptistry, the palazzo where Duke Cosimo lives with Duchess Eleonora. It's 1561, and I've lived my whole life under the rule of Duke Cosimo, Duke Cosimo de' Medici. He's a clever one, that's for sure. Everything runs like a well maintained clock under him. You want a sad story? This pretty arcade has seen a few. This wall here belongs to the famous Ospedale degli Innocenti, the foundling home built by Filippo Brunelleschi more than a century ago. This is where my life began. See this grated window? That's where my mamma left me when I was a newborn. She took my swaddled little body and pushed me through the grate. Then she pulled on the cord over there, and a bell... Over 12,000 souls lived within the Innocenti. Some parents abandoned children from sheer necessity. 
unable to provide food and shelter. Some infants were abandoned naked, others in rags, as those who pushed them through the grate did their best to wrap them in the materials they had available. And so you get a sense there of um, the character, the story, and the discover more interpretation. Marietta stands in some contrast to the elite widow Nicolosa Alessandri, whose trajectory through the city from near the cathedral to a family chapel in San Pier Maggiore is bounded by the spaces accessible to her piety, gender, and status. A comparison between the two characters, as Sharon Strokia and Julia Rombo have recently shown, offers a way of reflecting upon and communicating the distinct spatial implications of women's mobility in the public spaces of the city. While Ercole explores the at times thuggish nature of policing and public order in 16th century Florence under the Medici Grand Dukes, quite a different angle is given through an experiment with one of the best known figures of the previous century, Cosimo de' Medici, the Elder. Through an itinerary connecting some of the principal 15th century Medici sites in the city, our cultural biographical approach pointed beyond the pious man godfather dichotomy, dichotomy to link trophy cultural investment to interpretive storytelling, far removed from standard guidebook information about patrons and artists. Instead, our first character, the wool worker Giovanni Di Marco, leads visitors through an artisan's eye view, perspective of the city center and of the working class residential neighborhood where he lives in rented accommodation and has an active role in the local community gravitating around Sant'Ambrogio. So now I'm going to play a short promotion, well, descriptive documentary film uh, about the original Hidden Florence, which uses Giovanni as its main guide character. So I've always loved walking around cities and showing people what's there, what's there to be seen. And this is kind of how I got fascinated in GPS, because obviously what GPS allows you to do is it allows you to attach the stories of the past, the stuff of history. It allows you to attach them to the objects, to the buildings, to the fabric of the city. So it's an ideal way of uh, talking about the things that interest me, about street corners, about the way that people assemble uh, in shops, uh, the way that coats of arms talk to us from the past about the people that lived in the buildings uh, that we're standing in front of. Rather than just have your standard historian or tour guide taking people around the city, we thought it'd be really interesting to have a period character, an invented voice, but nonetheless a period character who essentially acts as your guide. And we felt that that would just be so much more immersive. In a way, you experience the city with the character. In a lot of ways, the app is about going to places that, that people don't normally go to, that are off the beaten track of tourist itineraries. So the idea, I suppose, was to find a character that could also give a different point of view in Florence. In this case, with Giovanni the Woolworker. Welcome to Florence. I'm Giovanni, Giovanni di Marco. It's the year of our Lord, 1490. Well, Giovanni is a war worker from roughly about 1490. Um, he's one of the, if you like, the disenfranchised majority of Florence. He's a non-citizen. He's one of the people who work in the vast Florentine textile industry. He's one of the, if you like, one of the people who make Florence tick. If we have an imagined user for this app, we'd probably imagine individuals with their smartphone. But obviously for our trial, or various trials that we've made over the past few months, We've worked with small groups, and it's quite interesting to see how uh, they respond in different ways to the audio content, to the specialist information that we're providing, and obviously to the visual cues that the phone screen offers. And then, principally, what I found very, very interesting is to see how, once they've actually been introduced to the object that they're looking at, they will spend most of the time looking at the object. It's a way of directly communicating information with the visual subject of your inquiry in front of you. Obviously, for an urban historian, this unlocks enormous potential because the fabric of the cities of Italy is, in many cases, still intact. For example, the workshop. Well done, you found it. 
the idea there was to bring Giovanni to a location where we could talk about a building which was very, very significant in the history of Florence, the cathedral. But rather than talk about the cathedral standing in front of the cathedral or up on the top of the dome, we wanted to take a location which gave our listeners an idea of how that massive dome was constructed by people. So we take you to the, essentially the modern site of the Cathedral Works Office, to the, to the Bottega, where stonecutters still work to create the replacement sculptures that adorn the exterior of the cathedral. In the background, you can see the dome, and Giovanni talks to you about the way that Florence is produced by, by workers like him, whether they're making wool cloth or whether they're building the buildings of the city. When people go around Florence, they get stories about the Medici, they get stories about the Rucciolai, they get stories about the Strozzi, whose palace I'm now standing in front of. What they rarely get are stories about wool workers like Giovanni. So we thought this was a really interesting way to impart uh, 50 or 60 years of research into social history of a city that really isn't normally presented to people. One of the things that made this project really quite exciting is that we're all increasingly aware um, of how we navigate the city using maps. Uh, Google Maps are something that everybody is conversant with. Rather than use a modern map, what we were able to do with Calvium was to peg the 16th century map made by Stefano Bonsignori, uh, the most accurate map of Renaissance Florence. We're able to peg that to a modern street map. So what the user is able to do is walk around the city if you like, in a 16th century street view experience, where the environment that they're walking through is represented, is visualized on the screen as a woodcut, an original woodcut in the 16th century. And they can see their own avatar, their, their own self, walking in the 16th century map. Which I think is what at least is quite neat. As became clear as we built up the Hidden Cities platform, um, with new cities and itineraries to go with them, the range of guides, themes and perspective is potentially as broad as the disciplinary variety of historical inquiry itself. That said, some patterns invariably emerge as the place-based format is informed by the Lefebvrean triad of how meaning is constructed through the interaction of people, places and objects operating together in urban public space. Meaning or interpretation is attached to specific sites that can be geo-referenced and objects from museum collections can be set back into dialogue with those sites through the, through the guide's careful prompts and subsequent discover more commentary. Some recurrent urban typologies emerge. Sites of encounter, of formal or informal exchange, of goods, information or services, or of popular sociability, for example revealing how gates, shops, taverns, or street corners serve as vectors of meaning. Similarly, the survival of historic built fabric and material culture is a powerful way of communicating the presence of the past in the cities of the presence, present, enabling, enabling an immediacy of connection, just at the same time as highlighting stark contrasts between how such sites might have previously functioned. A Renaissance hospital, with ambulance, ambulances parked outside it is strangely familiar. Just as the fact that the urban poor might turn to the same institution for free chicken broth seems remarkably foreign and remote. Furthermore, the medium of the app combined with the interpretative focus of the character guides has worked well to operationalize often theorized ideas about museums without walls whereby artifacts in museum collections can be virtually re relocated to their original find sites, ranging from street signage to archeological finds, such as the domestic pottery or the turkey bones mentioned earlier. In this last case, for instance, while the remarkable survival of bone artifacts of what may have been among the first turkeys consumed in England, shown on the right, um, justifies their display in a museum cabinet, the elite domestic context within which the fowl was consumed is underlined through a story that places the user in a wood panel alley on the left at the heart of the late medieval city, a merchant's house close to where the find was made, as shown in the picture in the middle. Museum partners have proved powerful allies in the development and delivery of our research, also through the indication, identification of artifacts to focus on. 
by connecting specialist historical research, the urban fabric and objects from museum collections, including his, the historic maps themselves. The process of making the app trails has encouraged collaborative working between academic researchers and curatorial staff in museums. Moreover, given the primarily digital nature of the audio and written content produced, this co-production has also facilitated the sharing of project outputs with museum partners. Such collaborations are mutually beneficial when the public history goals of the apps provide new interpretation of objects and themes of interest to curators. In turn, of course, museum visitors figure prominently among likely user groups for the apps. And here I'm going to show you another short video, which essentially talks about the research context within which the dissolution and dissent video uh, uh, app trail that I discussed earlier was produced as a, as you'll see. Hidden Exeter is one of five city apps that we've created through a European research funded project called Hidden Cities. Good day to you, traveler. Welcome to Exeter in this, the year 1588, the 30th year of Queen Elizabeth's reign. My name is Thomas Greenwood, at your service. Earlier this year, through some additional funding from Erasmus+, Plus, we started a new piece of work with students from the University of Exeter who worked with heritage institutions in our local community here in Exeter, working with colleagues at the Royal Albert Memorial Museum and at St Nicholas's Priory. We've created a new walk within the Hidden Exeter app. Ah. I see you've already got yourself a copy of Mr. John Hooker's splendid new map. Only the best cities have these. The beauty of the walking tour is that it allows us to trace the phases of the city's history in time and space. And we can quite literally travel in time. We can pass from Roman remains to medieval buildings still largely intact. Um, to then begin to understand how the early modern city and the modern city expand and break out beyond those Roman walls to become the, the lively and diverse city it is now. This is hugely valuable for historians because it allows us to take what we've discovered in an archive on a document in a fragment of history uh, that's been hidden away and actually transpose that into real space and to see it in three dimensions. And to see it, therefore, as the people who lived that history saw it and experienced it. And that's a rare opportunity for a historian. I think one of the most interesting things that students find about this story is that the primary represented community in 1536 in our story. And um, it's very much the same nowadays. We are trying to bring people back into the Priory, but also back into all our heritage sites. So we have a heritage community that is trying to reach out also to the academic community and equally the academics are trying to come and talk to us. So you have the students who are really the medium through which we are trying to get the research from the university down into the city and the experts from the city to talk to the students from the university. And I think this is where we find research being made meaningful for us here at the Priory and all the heritage sites in Exeter. RAM has some amazing objects in its collection and many of those relate to the archaeology of Exeter. We've got many on display, but we're always looking for innovative ways of making those objects accessible to people. So that's why it was particularly keen to work with the Hidden Exeter project. This is enabling people to get out into Exeter and actually experience some of those objects where they were found, of course, where they were used all those centuries ago. A walking tour is a great way to discover the history of a city because it enables you to make sense of what is otherwise often just a jumble of different time periods, different roof lines, ruins, modern buildings, all juxtaposed together. And through a walking tour, you can begin to put those 
different buildings and spaces into some sort of order and to trace the history of this place through them. You go from a, a jumble of jigsaw pieces into a picture that actually fits together. So then, a virtuous cycle has been outlined here through which academic research and curatorial expertise can be mobilized through collaborative working, creating new interpretation that is site-specific and public-facing. There is, of course, considerable scope for extending this experience, and indeed the Hidden Cities project is actively expanding the content of the initial six city apps, as well as developing a series of new apps through collaborations with other cities and academic partners. Furthermore, while the focus thus far has been firmly in the early modern era, we're currently developing an updated design interface that will enable us to offer itineraries that make use of historic maps from other periods so that contributors might be able to present a range of guide characters informed by their research, but also from different periods of the city's history. The technical challenge is limited to the key AR aspect of the app design, the historic map, used to, as a navigational aid over, over, overlaid on the familiar smartphone mapping system, so as to retain a coherence of the Hidden Cities format based around the historic map and guide character pay, pairing, providing a time travel experience through the modern day city. Finally, it's worth noticing that, that, as, as, an academic, um, that as academic colleagues have participated in the development, writing and editing for the respective Hidden Cities apps, so too they've been inevitably led to reformulate their research interests and themes through the filter of space and mobility, which remain fundamental frameworks for location-based interpretation. And this can be seen as a form of training in that these approaches reformulate how scholars approach their material specifically for these projects, but um, we've also found that this is fed into the um, academic essays that they've contributed in a number of cases to the recent publication that you can see on the screen here. And um, uh, just to draw your attention to the fact that yes, uh, it does have quite a high price, but it's also available in open access, so entirely for free. So I invite you to take a look at it, um, the published uh, side of our public history research. Um, so aside from book publishing, we've also um, had some less, uh, some more innovative than the more innovative nature of the work we've been doing has also been recognized by Apple, um, Apple, who have invited us to create a series of guides in their Maps app, which any of you with a um, Apple device will be familiar with have a go. Just search for any one of the hidden cities in the Maps app and you'll find our guide right below the Wikipedia text as you're seeing here with uh, the guides for a number of the cities as they appear on the phone screen. So that's a short outline of the Hidden Cities project. A number of new ones are coming. We're working with Copenhagen and Tour at the moment and I hope to do a Venice one later this year. And just incidentally, before moving on, I just wanted to mention one other last aspect um, of this is that, um, and, and this goes in a slightly different direction, this really speaks to the question of teaching, um, and that the software that we developed with Calvium, our technical partners, to make these apps, um, we've been able also to repurpose into teaching. So we can use the same software within a teaching, uh, teaching context to do group work with students in which students essentially uh, learn the practice of making um, place-based interpretation of using software to create a mobile phone app and essentially learning also skills about public history and communication. This is a fully digital 
project, a, a piece of group work, which I developed with colleagues um, uh, through uh, last year's lockdown when we were unable to take students on a field trip and was so successful that we're actually doing it again um, uh, with our students who will go on a field trip later this year. And I'm also experimenting it with uh, students in Venice where I'm currently um, doing a visiting professorship. So just to say that there's a sort of a full um, circle here is closed, bringing the research directly back into our teaching practice. Finally, in the shorter and final part of the talk, I'd like briefly to show how another project I've been running over the past couple of years also adopts smartphone, adapts, sorry, adopts smartphones and apps to bring the research that we've been doing to a wider audience of users in museums and cities. Florence, uh, in um, Florence 4D, as the name suggests, is, a, is concerned not just with the 2D vectors of geospatial data, latitude, longitude, or XY, nor exclusively with 3D modeling, XY and Z, the vertical three dimension, but also with change over time hence the fourth vector of time. Our primary research activity has actually been in the field of 3D modeling of built heritage and the reinstating of artworks now scattered around museum collections back into these models. To simplify, uh, we're making 3D models of buildings, such as the sorts of things that you might see um, in, in uh, computer games or in the CGI in movies, and we're putting artworks, which are now largely in museums around the world, back into those models. The work is pretty much at the cutting edge of digital art history and visualization approaches. And our work on Florence participates in wider debates and discussions about standards for research-based 3D modeling that I'm not going to be discussing today. Part of our outputs are indeed these 3D models, such as you're familiar with from, uh, as I say, from CGI in movies or computer games. But the big difference is that our models are not just, are, are not just research based, but we're working on how to footnote those models so they can be properly interrogated as a piece of research. We've also experimented with delivering these models as one-to-one -one location based experiences. And here I'm going to just show a, a short video that um, describes how one of these models, the model of the Church of San Pier Maggiore, a church which uh, is, has sub since, since been demolished, it was demolished in the 18th century, um, has been brought back to life through 3D model, a 3D model which can be uh, deployed through an app, um, both in Florence on the street, which uh, once was the nave of the church, and in London, where the high altarpiece from the church is now installed in the National Gallery's Sainsbury Wing. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll just let, let you essentially watch, watch the film. Um, but there, that's the altarpiece. You see that the 3D model um, uh, is built off that altarpiece in the gallery space uh, and can be experienced in the gallery as well as in London at a fully one-to-one -one scale. The Hidden Florence 3D app is the first version of an app that enables users in Florence and the National Gallery to experience the Church of San Pier Maggiore and its main altarpiece, which is now, uh, as I said, shown in, in perm on permanent display on the main axis of the Sainsbury Wing. And one of the things that's remarkable is that uh, the Sainsbury Wing is enti becomes entirely filled with this uh, 3D model and thus renders at some, in some way the full scale of, uh, of the church that originally um, the altarpiece was uh, the primary focus of. The focus of the project um, has in fact been, um, as I said, to develop a rigorous methodology for research-based 3D models drawn from historical sources, 
as um, such as extant buildings or arch uh, uh, the archaeological record, um, as well as documents in archives, and using portable scanners where possible to gather data. And that's what you can see on the screen here. We've adopted what's known as the CIDOC CRM ontology approach to create structured data that can be interrogated from the models themselves and is indeed machine readable. And these are the footnotes of the models. And we've built a prototype website where 2D geospatial data, maps, 3D models, as you've been seeing, and a database can all be accessed in one place. And uh, the technical challenge here in particular was making the models um, interoperable uh, across the app platform as well as the web viewer. And here it is a short screen piece of screen footage showing the website in action and showing you some of the features that we've been talking about, some of the um, aspects we've been talking about throughout the talk today, the laying of historic maps onto modern maps. In this case, you can see the little 3D models which um, reveal to the user uh, where there is 3D content um, attached to our, uh, attached to our uh, website. Um, and uh, shortly you'll be seeing also uh, the way that you can toggle between different map layers, the 16th century street view of Bonsignori, the late 17th century more accurate map of Zocchi, and the contemporary um, aerial uh, satellite view uh, that we're familiar with from Google and other platforms. Um, we can move through the uh, website, searching for different types of data, and then enter into the 3D model itself through this viewer window, which allows you to navigate through the building itself. Um, as you can see, using uh, a mouse, uh, I'm afraid that uh, my face is obscuring the bottom right hand corner, where you can see the navigation button, which allows you also to click between cr chronological periods. And on screen, you can see the hot spots which we've attached to objects so that people can learn about the objects in the screen itself and then connect to the database as you see here linking to one of the data entries um, of, around one of the paintings with the um, with the image viewer high quality uh, image viewer and then obviously linking to other objects uh, in in the database there so that's essentially been the sort of aim uh, uh, the to create a website which is a research-based uh, website. But as a result, we've also created a series of, um, uh, of uh, content which we're using uh, outside, um, outside of the website itself. And we've used tours as ways of essentially prevent providing users with samples of data which provide an interpreted research itinerary through what can otherwise be mesmerizing amounts of information. As I said, the data and the modeling part of the project is fiendishly complex, and I'd be happy to discuss that separately. And indeed, for those of you watching this recording online, there are um, recordings by the Florence 4D team uh, available on the internet that talk more about this technical side of the project. Throughout, we've also continued to work with museums to ensure the research is also made available to the wider public through video animations, as well as apps. So through the uh, example I was showing earlier, um, I was illustrating the church of Santa Maria degli Innocenti, Brunelleschi's church in Florence. And we've actually used that same model, the model you saw in the web viewer, to create a piece of animation, which is now, uh, is now uh, running in the Museo degli Innocenti uh, in Florence, which some of you may, may well know. And this is that short, vid this is a, a sample of that uh, video. Uh, showing in the museum.
So there, um, uh, as you can see, we've continued to work with museums with our outputs so as to make the research directly relevant to how people understand artworks in museums and can recover their original viewing contexts. And so here in these photos, you can see on the bottom left um, how uh, uh, the video uh, or a longer, ver a long version, a more informative and labeled version of that prom short promotional video is running in the museum uh, in the Innocenti Museum in the room directly adjacent to the original paintings themselves um, there. And we're, continuing to ex and we're continuing to expand the scope of the Hidden Florence 3D app, somewhat along the lines of the growth of the Hidden Cities apps that I was talking about earlier, to enable new buildings to be brought into the system based around new opportunities for partners working with us, with museums. So here in these pictures, you can see us earlier this year um, in the VNA uh, uh, measuring up so, uh, so that we can deliver the same 3D experience as we've done for the National Gallery, the Jacopo di Cione High Altarpiece, uh, we can run that same experience in the VNA Gallery so that uh, visitors can experience the um, Della, Della Robbia uh, angels that you see on the left hand side of the screen there. Um, we can see that they can see those uh, in the context of the original church and altarpiece which they formed a part of. Um, a related piece of work. Um, of animation, uh, digital animation work is in fact currently running, uh, went live last week at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge as part of the Hockney's Eye, the art of technology of, dis of depiction uh, in which we've um, uh, uh, shown through video uh, how perspective uh, was used and modified by artists in the early 15th century in Florence. So then uh, to return to where I began, the Hidden Cities and Hidden Florence 3D apps represent an ongoing experiment in how ubiquitous handheld consumer devices might be adopted by historians in ways that touch most aspects of their academic activity, from research to dissemination through even to pedagogy. As we've developed the apps with growing numbers of academic contributors and museum partners, the centrality of the research that informs the interpretation in various formats audio, text, and visual resources, including maps and 3D models, has remained to the fore. In so doing, we hope to have indicated how pervasive digital tools and modes of delivery might be adopted by humanities scholars while retaining scholarly integrity throughout. We very much hope and expect there to be imitators, but also welcome contributors to join us in this endeavor. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you also for your patience in waiting for this um, recording to be made available online uh, if you were among uh, the audience that um, had a disappointing experience uh, on the day that I gave the talk uh, last week.